At six, the government confirms it's scaling back its high-speed rail plans for England and spending billions on improvements instead. The extension of the HS2 rail line between the East Midlands and Leeds has been scrapped. A new Trans-Pennine route linking Leeds and Manchester won't be built in full. If HS2 is not going to be arriving in Yorkshire in the way it was meant to be arriving in Yorkshire, that undermines the local place and that affects businesses of every sector. But the government says its £96 billion track and rail improvements will make journey times faster sooner. I think that this is a fantastic, this is a, a monumental programme for, for rail investment, for, for commuters, for passengers uh, for, in uh, the East Midlands, West Midlands, the whole of the north of the country. We'll be getting reaction from commuters and businesses also on the programme tonight. Ambulance services and A&E departments in Wales record their worst ever performance times. Victims of the cladding crisis, a new study reveals anxiety, depression and thoughts of self-harm. Just kind of like a crippling depression where you can't get up, um, just couldn't see the point in anything. I had a really bleak outlook on life. And Lady Gaga on channelling her childhood experiences into her new film, The House of Gucci. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, the latest on Peng Shui, the tennis player who hasn't been heard of for two weeks since making sexual assault allegations against a top Chinese government official. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. The government has scrapped the HS2 line between the East Midlands and Leeds, which was promised a decade ago. Instead, as part of the integrated rail plan, the government will increase investment in existing lines, which they say will deliver faster journeys sooner. But Labour has called the scaling back of the high-speed rail line a betrayal of the north. HS2 was originally meant to connect London with Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds. The leg between the East Midlands and Leeds will now be scrapped. Between Manchester and Leeds, there will be some improvements with new high-speed rail in parts, but not what was planned. Ministers say the journey between those two cities will still be cut from 53 to 33 minutes instead of 29 minutes, as had been promised. In total, £96 billion will now be spent upgrading existing services and building new but shorter stretches of high-speed track. Well, Katie Austin is in Leeds for us tonight. Katie. Yes, the backers of this plan, including the Prime Minister, say it's much better value for money and strikes a much better balance between improving local services and delivering new high-speed lines. But others, including many here in Yorkshire, see the scaling back of two major rail projects as nothing less than a broken pledge. <laughs> This South Yorkshire logistics business has been on its own fast journey of expansion and it's not done yet. The boss hoped HS2 stretching up to Leeds would free up much more space on the railways for freight and ease road congestion. I really think that the country needs more rail, more rail infrastructure to reduce carbon, take more wagons off the road and improve on supply chain demands. The government insists its new plan will still produce faster journey times and add capacity, but deliver improvements sooner. That's not enough for some. If HS2 is not going to be arriving in Yorkshire in the way it was meant to be arriving in Yorkshire, that undermines the local place and that affects businesses of every sector. And therefore, people from all walks of life, you know, whether they're in rail or whatever industry, are upset and invested in this decision. 42 of the £96 billion announced today was already allocated to the first stages of HS2, linking London to Birmingham and Crewe. Among the schemes to be funded by the remaining money are the western leg of HS2 to Manchester and extensive upgrades to other parts of the rail network. Two other sections of high-speed rail will be built, but those sections will be smaller and cheaper than under previous proposals. The Prime Minister nearly missed his train to Yorkshire today. Once on board, though, he defended the changes. Why should people in the north accept less than they were promised? Because they're getting an absolutely fantastic new system. And yes, of course... It's not quite be, what they were promised. people who argue that you're better off spending a long time and, and tens of billions more 
carving through virgin countryside and building whole new lines everywhere. Uh, but what we're doing is doing something that it brings the, the benefits 10 years or up to 10 years faster and delivers much shorter journey times. But Labour has accused the government of going back on its word. The North of England have been betrayed because the Prime Minister made two very important promises. HS2 all the way uh, to Leeds, a new line. Um, that promise has been ripped up. He also promised the Northern Powerhouse Rail, a new line from Manchester to Leeds, and that plan's been ripped up. The plans have received more of a welcome in some places. So Midlands Connect thinks this is, thinks this is a win for the Midlands um, because it will take high-speed trains from Birmingham to the East Midlands, but also allows us to progress our flagship scheme, the Midlands Rail Hub, which will unlock 11 million seats along uh, the rail network, allowing us to have quicker journeys from places like Hereford, Worcester, and other cities up and down the Midlands. And opponents of HS2 are celebrating. Is it good news or what? The railway would have torn right through this village near Rotherham. In parts of Northern England, though, there's a feeling what could have been a golden opportunity has been diminished. Katie Austin, BBC News. Well, one city that will definitely lose out is Bradford. It had hoped to be included on the proposed new Leeds to Manchester line with a station built for the new trains. Well, Danny Savage has been getting reaction to today's news. The north of England, a place where new trains run on old lines. There's a load of land outside as well, and we can make this into a station by 2028. There was hope that this market in Bradford would be redeveloped as a station for a new high-speed Trans-Pennine link known as Northern Powerhouse Rail. But today, that hope died. Really disappointing. I mean, I am somebody who puts uh, my place above politics, so I genuinely believe government when they say they want to level up and they want to invest. But this is a real kick in the teeth for the North. Journey times from Bradford to Leeds will be halved but passengers heading west to Manchester and beyond are disappointed. So I catch the train from Bradford to Bolton. It can take up to two hours. It would have been great, wouldn't it, for the north, you know what I mean, to be able to travel, you know, on like a train that gets you somewhere to your destination a lot faster. Instead of a new link, this existing one between Huddersfield and Leeds is going to be upgraded. Today's announcements will transform this line, but it won't be easy. This is a railway the Victorians built. There's an awful lot of engineering work to be done, and it will take years. The plan has divided Tory MPs, whose constituencies are 75 miles apart. What I was very hopeful to see was Northern Powerhouse Rail with a stop in Bradford. We are one of the most socially deprived areas of the UK and I'm really passionate about increasing that economic prosperity of the Bradford district. And of course that relies on having excellent transport links east but also west to Manchester. I think levelling up personally is about creating good, sustainable, well-paid jobs and helping people to get there. Uh, and there are lots of things to celebrate from a Nottinghamshire perspective in this plan. But what do the paying customers in Leeds think? It seems like, obviously, Lancashire side, it's all been sorted that way. They're giving us these fantastic times so you're going to get to London. But here, it's just, it seems as if we've been forgotten yet again. I think it just creates a bigger divide, doesn't it, with, um, with the north and the south, which is, which is a shame. Yeah, I suppose it's disappointing. But again, it's not something I was desperately in the need of. I think what we've got already is more than sufficient. In time, passengers will notice a better rail network in the north. But today's announcement falls far short of aspirations this government built up. Danny Savage, BBC News. Our correspondent Caroline Davis is in Westminster now. So a lot of anger and disappointment. Ministers do say, though, with all this investment, journey times are going to be substantially faster sooner. How realistic is that? Well, the government would certainly say that they've put this through a full assessment and that is workable. But this isn't just about journey times, it's also about capacity. And without that extra high-speed line, that will certainly be reduced. It's really important to remember the background to this. Conservative Party policy has been about HS2 route to Leeds for years. And along with Northern Powerhouse Rail, that has been a key part of the levelling up agenda. Now, whatever way you turn it, this is a different plan. The government would say a better plan, the old one was outdated, this will deliver more, faster 
Minister. Labour have said, of course, this is a broken promise that leaves the North behind. Some Tory MPs have reacted uh, in different ways. This wasn't going to advantage everybody. But those who feel like they have been left behind say that their constituents already feel like they have been shortchanged. Caroline Davis in Westminster. Thank you. NHS hospital emergency departments in Wales and its ambulance service have recorded their worst performance figures ever. Last month, ambulances reached just half of life-threatening calls within eight minutes. Waiting lists have grown again, with 21% of the Welsh population currently waiting for planned treatments. Our Wales correspondent, Hal Griffith, reports. For Linda, life on the waiting list is about managing pain and frustration. It's almost two years since she was referred for a double knee replacement. She can no longer work and at the age of 50 now needs a wheelchair. There's still no date for her operation. My life is running away and I've got no, no future at the moment until I have a date that I know things are going to start to pick up. Everything is deteriorating by the day and the pain is unbearable. It is unbearable to live with. Across Wales, one-fifth of the population is now on a waiting list. And of those, almost half have been waiting over six months. Coronavirus has clearly added pressure on the NHS. But the problems here predate the pandemic. Surgical waiting times in Wales haven't been reached at any point in the last decade, despite reforms and investment. Surgeons say they too are frustrated. Even before the pandemic, I was seeing patients who'd waited two years for their tr surgical treatment. I wouldn't say the pandemic is convenient, but it certainly has given politicians of all sorts across the country something else to blame. Ambulance response times and waits in A&E are also now the worst on record. Under the Welsh Labour government, some targets haven't been hit in a decade. Of course people in Wales deserve better. It is very difficult to deliver on this in the middle of the pandemic. And what's interesting... But the problems predate the pandemic. Well, we have put in significant additional resources over several years. 53% uh, additional uh, staffing uh, since in those past 20 years. And so we have invested in the NHS. Linda fears her wait may soon enter a third year. Until then, every day means enduring more pain. Howell Griffith, BBC News. The latest government figures show there were 46,807 new COVID infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, the highest daily figure for a month. On average, 39,500 new cases were reported per day in the past week. 199 deaths were recorded. That's of people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID test. On average, in the past week, 147 related deaths were recorded every day. Almost 13.9 million people have now had their booster injection. The man who led the review 10 years ago into the future funding of social care in England has told MPs that poorer people will be hit hardest by the government's proposed changes to the social care cap. Sir Andrew Dilnot said he was very disappointed that under the new plans, a significant number of England's poorest pensioners, especially those in the north, face paying the same for their care as wealthier people in the south. In September, the government said no one would pay more than £86,000 in care fees during their lifetime from 2023. Our health correspondent Catherine Burns has the details. Ten weeks ago, the government announced a plan for social care in England. Oh, it's very complicated. A main point was that no one should have to pay more than £86,000 over their lifetime for care costs. Now, the detail, including that any help pensioners get from their local authority, won't count towards that cap. <laughs> Giving evidence to MPs today, the economist who led a review into social care, he says he's very disappointed. People who are hit hard are those who have long care journeys, who go on needing to make a contribution of their own, and they end up having spent exactly the same amount as their better off counterparts. Let's take two pensioners with the exact same health problems, meaning they need £860 worth of care a week. Pensioner A lives in a terrace house in Guildford, valued at around £450,000. 
That means he doesn't get any help until he's spent £86,000. Pensioner B also lives in a terrace house in Hartlepool. This is worth about £80,000, which means he does qualify for some immediate help. Let's say the council pays half. Until yesterday, it was assumed they'd both pay for their care until the costs had reached that cap at 100 weeks. After that, the government would take over. Now that is still true for pensioner A, but the new detail changes things for our less well-off pensioner B. Now he would need to continue paying for 200 weeks. In other words, they both end up paying the exact same amount, but it's a much higher proportion of pensioner B's assets. The Prime Minister insists everyone will be better off under the new plans than the existing system. This is a massive improvement for everybody in the whole country because what we're saying is that for the first time in history uh, we're stopping people having to, to, to pay unlimited quantities for their, for their care. Critics warn that this plan could largely affect people in parts of the country with lower property prices. For people of low and moderate levels of wealth, it's less good for them than the scheme we thought the government was committed to. And what that will mean is for those people, those with low and moderate levels of wealth, they may still need to use all of the assets and savings they have to pay for social care. There'll be a vote on this in Parliament next week. It'll be interesting to see if Conservative MPs in the North and the Midlands will back an idea that could hit their constituents harder. Catherine Burns, BBC News. The time is just after quarter past six, our top story this evening. The government confirms it's scaling back its high-speed rail plans for England and investing £96 billion on improvements instead. And coming up, how babies' heads are being reshaped with the pioneering use of virtual reality at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. And coming up on Sports Day on the BBC News channel, Stephen Gerrard looks ahead to life at Aston Villa, saying it's very unfair to call the club a stepping stone towards his dream job of one day managing Liverpool. More than four years after the Grenfell Tower fire, up to half a million people are still living in blocks of flats with flammable cladding and fire safety issues. It's left many feeling scared and trapped in their own homes. Now, a new study of those caught up in the cladding crisis has found people are being treated for anxiety, depression and on medication, with some even having thoughts of self-harm and suicide. Sarah Corker has been given exclusive access to the report. Are you okay? Sophie bought her first yeah. home in Chelmsford it's just weeks before son You're Reuben really was good. born. A proud moment, but all that quickly changed. Which bit of the building is, is the problem? Um, so all of this is ACM cladding. Yes. That's the same type of cladding as Grenfell. To remove it could cost flat owners thousands. And living here is taking its toll on Sophie's mental health. It's kind of like a crippling depression where you can't get up. Um, just couldn't see the point in anything and I've had such bad issues with my anxiety. Some days I feel like I can't leave the house and I have like physical problems leaving the house because I all feel so sick. Sophie's now been prescribed anti-anxiety medication and her doctor was so shocked by the cladding situation he wrote to Sophie's MP imploring her to raise the issue in Parliament. The Housing Select Committee has warned that the cladding scandal is becoming a public health crisis and psychologists have told the BBC that people living in these conditions with no end in sight will need long-term counselling and support to get through it. New research by the University of Sheffield based on a series of in-depth interviews found the situation is having a catastrophic impact on the mental health of some leaseholders. Things like just feeling that they couldn't go on, that they were trapped and that they couldn't see a way out of this crisis was leading to feelings of um, suicide and self-harm. And in those situations, individuals had to seek immediate help either for themselves or for a member of their household. It's like having a ball and chain wrapped around your legs. Will is a junior doctor who owns a flat in Sheffield with dangerous cladding. So I'm going to show you this video diary you did a year ago to see what's changed for you. I'm just, I'm just so exhausted and so tired of this situation. It is so consuming. An absolutely 
fantastic supporter of us. Campaigning for change has helped him cope, but Will deeply regrets his decision to ever buy a flat. I was so embarrassed. I was, I was utterly ashamed that I, like a sensible person, had made this colossal mistake, like this huge error of judgement, and that the impact it's had on my mental health will stay with me forever. The government says it's allocated £5 billion to make the highest grist block safe. But we also have a responsibility to relieve some of the obligations that are being faced by leaseholders at the moment, who are innocent parties in this. You can hold my hand. Back in Chelmsford, since we filmed with Sophie, the developer has now agreed to pay to remove the dangerous cladding. It's a huge relief, but for thousands of others, the wait for help continues. Sarah Corker, BBC News in Essex. The former Yorkshire cricketer Azim Rafiq has apologised and said he is deeply ashamed after it emerged he had used anti-Semitic language in social media messages 10 years ago. Rafiq has been at the centre of the racism controversy which has engulfed Yorkshire Cricket Club. Our sports correspondent Natalie Perks is with me now. So messages sent on social media 10 years ago, what more can you tell us? Well, on Tuesday we saw, didn't we, quite harrowing testimony that he gave about the racism he'd experienced, which he said had robbed him of his career. Tonight he's had to apologise on social media uh, for these historic messages he exchanged with another player which appear to be anti-Semitic in nature. So tonight he said, I have absolutely no excuses. I'm, a, I'm ashamed of this exchange and have now deleted it so as not to cause further offence. I was 19 at the time, and I hope and believe I'm a different person today. I'm incredibly angry at myself, and I apologise to the Jewish community and everyone who is rightly offended by this. Now, there's been a big response. The Board of Deputies for British Jews has responded, saying, Azim Rafiq has suffered terribly at the hands of racists, so he will well understand the hurt this exchange will cause to Jews who've supported him. His apology seems heartfelt. We have no reason to believe he's not completely sincere. Rafiq told the BBC yesterday that he hopes by speaking out... This will be the moment not only sport but society as a whole moves in a different direction. Natalie Burks, thank you. A man who stabbed eight people in Birmingham city centre in September last year, killing one of them, has been detained for a minimum of 21 years. Zephaniah McLeod, who is 28 and has paranoid schizophrenia, will serve his sentence in a secure hospital. From Birmingham, Phil Mackey reports. In court, it was described as a murderous rampage. I've just been found out someone else has been stabbed now. Zephaniah McLeod stabbed eight people, killing one and leaving two more fighting for their lives. They were serious attacks, often targeted towards people's head, neck and upper chest areas, um, which have left victims with some catastrophic injuries. In the confusion, police didn't initially realise all the attacks were related, but within a day they'd arrested McLeod. Jacob Billington died after being stabbed in the neck. Welcome to the Vedettes Garden Sessions. This is him on the left with his band. The singer, second from right, is his best friend, Michael Callahan, who was also stabbed. Michael nearly died. In a statement read in court, he said he sometimes wished he hadn't made it, but he's made astonishing progress and was determined to come to court. At the time, McLeod was psychotic and hearing voices. He'd only recently been released from prison and wasn't being supervised. McLeod was allowed to carry out a rampage on the streets of Birmingham, attacking eight innocent people. This included my lovely son, Jacob, and his friend, Michael. Those who are responsible for the monitoring of McLeod have many questions to answer. The impact of what happened is still being felt, not least by the family and friends of Jacob Billington, who was described as a talented and decent young man with a bright future ahead of him. Phil Mackey, BBC News, Birmingham. New virtual reality technology is being used for the first time by surgeons at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London to help families facing agonising decisions about agreeing to surgery on their children. The first to benefit are parents of babies who have a condition which affects the way their child's skull develops, as, Barbara, as BBC Click's Lara Lewington explains. You are a happy boy, aren't you? Archie was born with sagittal synostosis, which, although not life-threatening, left his parents faced with a difficult decision whether to risk surgery or leave nature to take its course with the physical and psychological impacts that would follow. And obviously there is always that worry about 
what he's going to have done. Virtual reality is helping them decide. Parents Amanda and Judd can interact along with the surgeon in this immersive illustration of the procedure. From all angles, they can see exactly how Archie's head can be reshaped with surgery. So here the grey is the head shape as it's now. The green is the predicted head shape. Data from 60 operations over the course of seven years has been harnessed to create these images. It's hard to, to put words to it, but as well as it's a lot to take in, it's, it's reassuring. Reassured, four weeks later, they brought Archie in for his surgery. The theatre's just being prepared as in a few minutes Archie's coming in for his surgery, where a spring like this is going to be inserted into his skull through a small cut. It will immediately expand and start to change the shape of his head and then continue to do so over the next four weeks. At that point, it can be removed. This technique provides the predictable outcomes that made the data usable for creating the visualisations with 90% accuracy. OK, posterior spring engaged. So we've just finished. The surgery's gone really well. The springs are in. We've seen an expansion on the table. And we should meet our predictions over the next few weeks. Two weeks on from surgery, and we visited Archie and his family. Archie's doing really well. Having the opportunity of doing the VR really, really sort of reassured us that we was doing the right thing. Yeah, we're happy. So the hope is for a future where more people can feel better prepared ahead of surgery, thanks to a clearer vision of what to expect. Lara Lewington, BBC News. Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall have arrived in Egypt for a two-day visit as part of their Middle Eastern tour. Upon their arrival in Cairo, Prince Charles held talks with Egypt's president before visiting the ancient Giza pyramids and the Sphinx. They were given a tour by the Egyptian Minister of Antiquities, which included the seventh wonder of the world, the Great Pyramid, which they partially climbed. Now, next week sees the release of a new film called House of Gucci, directed by Ridley Scott. It focuses on the turbulent relationship between the Italian businessman and the one-time head of the Gucci fashion house, Maurizio Gucci, and his wife, Patrizia, who was jailed for arranging his assassination. It stars Lady Gaga as Patrizia, who says she prepared for the role by drawing on the abuse she suffered as a teenager. Here's our entertainment correspondent, Lisa Mazimba. It was a name that sounded so seductive. In 1998, Patrizia Reggiani was convicted of arranging the murder of her former husband, Maurizio Gucci, of the Gucci fashion empire. To play her, Lady Gaga immersed herself in months of preparation. I don't consider myself to be a particularly ethical person. Finding the pain the character experienced as a woman in a male-dominated world came from Lady Gaga's own past. What was the most relevant about my personal experience as uh, Lisa was the trauma that I've been through in my life, being assaulted when I was 19 by a music producer. I took from every trigger point that I could find. So it was very painful. The singer has spoken in the past about how, before she became one of music's biggest stars, she suffered not one but multiple sexual assaults, leading to post-traumatic stress disorder. I have complex PTSD, so that's, that's not a single incident PTSD, it's multiple incidents. I used all of them at different times, in different moments in the script. It's what I was compelled to do for the role because I thought to myself, well, there's simply no other answer for why she would have her husband murdered. Gucci needs no blood. Goodbye 1930s. Hello 80s. She says the film's director, Ridley Scott, was constantly concerned Hello, Gucci. Come that she was immersing herself too deeply into painful memories. Reliving your trauma for a character is maybe not the healthiest thing, but I'm a romantic. I have a romance with the script, a romance with my character, a romance with the cast. It was, I think, in a way therapeutic in the way that what he called it was an exorcism. I relived all of this to play her. Lady Gaga, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lisa. 
time now for a look at the weather with Louise Lear. Hello. Hello there, another beautiful day to soak up some of autumn's glory. Who'd have thought mid-November we'd actually be seeing te temperatures into the mid-teens. That's what we've had today in Aberdeenshire, 16 Celsius, parts of Northumberland as well, and parts of Northern England generally. Now the mild weather is set to stay with us as high pressure dominates the weather story over the next few days, dragging in the southwesterly flow. Yes, this weather front into the far north will bring some freshening winds and some outbreaks of rain, but chiefly to the northwest to the Great Glen, but with all the cloud around through the night, we're going to start off tomorrow incredibly mild. These temperatures are more like daytime maximums rather than minimum. So a mild start to Friday, a murky start to Friday. A lot of cloud, the cloud thick enough for some drizzle along west-facing coast. There's our weather front to the northwest of the Great Glen across the Northern Isles, bringing some outbreaks of rain. But into the afternoon, maybe to the east of the Pennines, east of Scotland, we'll see the cloud breaking up, some sunshine, and yet again, temperatures into the mid-teens. Not for long however things are set to change as we move into the weekend that weather front a cold front is going to gradually sink its way south the uh, wind direction changes to a northerly driving in colder arctic air with it so on saturday outbreaks of rain to scotland northern ireland northern england for a time the colder air sitting in behind ahead of it quite a pleasant day actually with some sunny spells around and still those temperatures pleasant enough at 13 celsius the high but the cold air continues to sink its way steadily southwards through saturday night as that weather front a week affair by then just a band of cloud and nuisance rain across southern England but look at where the isobars are coming from a cold start to Sunday morning a touch of frost in sheltered rural glens of Scotland but it's going to get colder still as we go through the week ahead so we're going to close out the month of November on a chilly note with even the potential towards the end of the week of some snow showers and even at lower levels Sophie please thank you and that's all from the BBC News at six. It's goodbye from me on BBC One. We join the BBC's news teams where you are. Goodbye.